revisit prior updates and look at some of the prophecies that made it on this top 10 list. And I realized that it really needed to be updated, especially in light of the commencement of COVID-19 at the beginning of this year, which I think you would agree has changed everything in this world. So much so that it will never be the same again. The world we once knew is gone. And now what is ahead is exactly what we're told in Bible prophecy will be ahead, according to God's Word. If you'll kindly indulge me, I want to go through the list of the top 10 Bible prophecies in play today that are being fulfilled at what seems to be warp speed. I choose that phrase for what I think would be deemed obvious reasons. Now pictured here is at a glance, the top 10 prophecies with the scriptures in order. And there's going to be a link uh, to a PDF file, and it's going to be below along with a lot of other links today. We have a lot of links today uh, below in the description field. And this will uh, take you to a PDF file that you can actually print out, give out. I want to go through it real quick first, and then we'll take a look at each one of these. At number 10, I have the mocking of Bible prophecy and Christians who long for, watch for, are ready for the rapture, the Lord's return. This is 2 Peter chapter 3. At number nine, I have the sudden destruction of Damascus, Syria. This is a prophecy in Isaiah 17, 1, and also Jeremiah chapter 49, verses 23 through 27. At number eight, ties into number nine, it's the allied invasion of Israel from Syria, led by Russia, Iran, and Turkey, who will be at the helm. This is Ezekiel 38 and 39 with it. At number seven, I have massive earthquakes increasing in frequency and intensity. This is Matthew 24, 4 through 8, Luke 21, 10 and 11. At number six, increase of wickedness, as in the days of Noah, as in the days of Lot, Luke 17, verses 26 through 29. At number five, along with it, the increase of lawlessness. This is 2 Thessalonians, really the entire chapter, but uh, more specifically verses 1 through 12. We just completed our study verse by verse through both 1 and 2 Thessalonians. Number four, a global cry for peace and security. This is 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 verse 3. At number three, the intoxicating obsession with dividing Jerusalem. This is Zechariah chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. At number two, the confirming of a seven-year peace agreement with many, Daniel 9, 27, clearly a prophecy in play today, right before our very eyes. And at number one, last but certainly not least, and this is where we're going to spend the majority of our time today, it's this forming of a one world religion, a one world government, and a one world economy. And you can find these prophecies in the book of Revelation, namely chapter 17 and chapter 18. But what we're going to look at today is the well-known passage in Revelation chapter 13, specifically verses 11 through 18. All right, that's the top 10 prophecies at a glance. Uh, if you'll kindly allow me to, I'd like to take a closer look at each one of these, starting with number 10 and the mocking of Bible prophecy and Christians, the ridiculing of Christians who actually still believe, imagine this, that the Lord's coming back. Oh, come on. Really? My great, 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 great grandfather's grandfather's dog thought the Lord was going to come back in their lifetime, and still He hasn't come. 
That's basically a very loose paraphrase of what the Apostle Peter says in his second. Stand that in the last days scoffers will come, scoffing, and here we're told why, by the way, following their own evil desires. Oh, that's telling. They don't want the Lord to come back because they're enjoying their evil lifestyles and their wickedness. More on that in a moment. Verse 4, they will say, this is, this is what they're going to say, and I would venture to say that there's not a one of us in here that hasn't heard someone say these words in a different form, but basically the same gist of it. Here's what they're going to say, Peter says, where is this coming? Where is this coming, he promised? Ever since our ancestors died, everything goes on as it has since the beginning of creation. Well, at least they acknowledge creation. Well, not so fast, because Peter's going to go on to address how they deliberately, you know what deliberately means? It's, I know this is deeply profound, it's deliberate. Again, I know deeply profound, but they deliberately dismiss and forget that God created and then God destroyed the creation when God judged the world. Let me just say very quickly, in the interest of time, judgment's coming. Judgment's coming. God is not mocked. Whatsoever a man sows, that shall he also reap. Judgment is coming. But you know what's coming for the believer? Jesus is coming. And He's going to take us out of this world before the judgment comes upon this Christ-rejecting world. That's what's coming. And it's very close. Number nine. This is a prophecy about Damascus, Syria, very specific, found in Isaiah 17, 1. A prophecy against Damascus. See? Damascus will no longer be a city, but will become a heap of ruins. Over the last several years, particularly the last, I want to say probably two to three years, we've focused on this specific prophecy and its relationship to the next prophecy on our list, which is the Gog, Magog invasion of Israel in Ezekiel 38. Because this allied advance and invasion of nations comes from Syria. And what makes it so interesting is that to a nation, they are in Syria at the ready, waiting for the green light, if you will. And what's really interesting about that green light, it's God who puts the green light up with the hook in their jaw to bring them against His people and then they will be dealt a devastating defeat. And then when they are defeated, God declares, I did it this way at this time for this reason, so that they will know that I am the Lord, their God. That's Ezekiel 38. Let me just real quick read verses 1 through 6. And then I also want to read verse 13, because that is a, <laughs> a detail in this already detailed prophecy that speaks to exactly what we saw on our news feeds this last week. So the word of the Lord came to me, verse 1, Son of man, set your face against Gog of the land of Magog, the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal, prophesy against him and say, this is what the sovereign Lord says. I am against you, Gog, chief prince of Meshach and Tubal. I will turn you around, put hooks in your jaws, and bring you out with your whole army, your horses, your horsemen fully armed, and a great horde with large and small shields, all of them brandishing their swords. Verse 5, now we have the list of nations that will be a part of this alliance of nations, and they're listed by their ancient names. First on the list, verse 5, Persia, Iran, Cush, and Put will be with them, all with shields and helmets. Also Gamar, 
with all its troops, and Beit Togarma from the far north with all its troops, the many nations with you. And then verse 13 gets very interesting, because we're told that Sheba and Dedan and the merchants of Tarshish and all her villages will say to you, have you come to take plunder? Have you gathered your hordes to loot, to carry off silver and gold, to take away livestock and goods, and to seize much plunder? In other words, Sheba and Dedan and Tarshish and the young merchants are all going to just question this invasion. They're not going to be a part of this invasion. And the question is very clear. Are you coming to take what Israel has, the prosperity that Israel has? Is Israel prosperous today? You better believe it. And that is the purpose of this invasion, is to take from Israel this loot, this plunder. And Sheb and Dedan and others with her are going to protest and question it. Do you know who Sheba and Dedan is? Saudi Arabia, that area that we know today as Bahrain, the United Arab Emirates et al. Does that sound familiar? Just this last week, the announcement of Sudan, which is kind of puzzling. Some have suggested that actually Sudan is a part of this alliance of nations that invades Israel. But all of those Arab nations in that area are all now coming and to the table, as it were, and they are normalizing relations with Israel, exactly as the prophet stated some 2,500 plus years ago. And it's happening right now. Again, this ties into what we're going to see here in a moment. At number seven, I have massive earthquakes increasing in frequency and intensity. I've been following this particular prophecy uh, for the better part of 30 years, actually. I gave my life to the Lord 38 years ago. And this prophecy in Matthew 24 has always intrigued me. It's on the heels of a question that Jesus is asked by the disciples concerning the end of the age and His coming. What are going to be the signs? And so Jesus answers their question. And in verse 4 He says, watch out. First one out of the chute. Listen, watch out that no one deceives you. Oh, for many will come in My name claiming, I am the Messiah, and will deceive many. Let me just parenthetically say that one of the markers of the last days will be deception. Deception. The Apostle Paul echoes the words of the Savior, the, the words of warning concerning deception. Now verse 6, he says, you will hear of wars and rumors of wars, better understood as threats of wars along with the wars. But see to it that you are not alarmed. Such things must happen, but the end is still to come. It's just the beginning of the end. <laughs> and then he says this, verse 7, nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. Very interesting. We see this on our televisions and news feeds today. And I'll explain why I say that. The original word in the original language of the New Testament Greek for uh, nation is ethnos, where we get our English word for ethnic or ethnicity. You know what Jesus is saying? That race will rise up against race, ethnicity against ethnicity, kingdom against kingdom. And then He says, there will be famines and earthquakes in various places. And then verse 8, he says, all these are the beginning of birth pains. In other words, he takes this, this list that I just read, and he says, all of them are going to be like birth pains. What do we know to be true about birth pains? They come in greater frequency and greater intensity. 
So then wouldn't it stand to reason that we should be able to go back, not very far, but we should be able to see an increase of intense earthquakes like labor pains? Yes. Pictured here is such a chart. It's generated by One Path Publishing. It was in the documentary by Ingenuity Films called The Coming Convergence. I highly recommend it. And it's a chart compiled from the USGS sensor data, and it shows earthquakes with a magnitude 6.3 and greater. Notice, from 1920 to the present, the increase. And what really has the experts concerned is that it's just a matter of time before said earthquakes will trigger volcanic eruptions that could potentially create these massive landslides into the ocean, exactly as is prophesied and described in the book of Revelation during the seven year tribulation. Number six. This is a, man, increase of wickedness, not lawlessness, wickedness. We'll get to lawlessness next. Listen to what Jesus said in Luke's Gospel, chapter 17, verses 26 through 29. Just as it was in the days of Noah, what was it like in the days of Noah? Genesis 6, I encourage you to read it, particularly verse 5, where we're told that <laughs> they were so wicked, get this, they were so wicked that they would invent new ways of being wicked. They would wake up in the morning and think, hey, what wickedness could we do today? That's how wicked they were. I mean, they, they, they only always continually had evil thoughts and inventions and actions. They were so evil. So Jesus is saying, so also will it be in the days of the Son of Man. They're going to be that evil, that wicked. And then he says, people were eating, drinking, marrying, being given in marriage, up to the day Noah entered the ark. Then the flood came and destroyed them all. It was the same in the days of Lot. Need I remind you what it was like in Sodom and Gomorrah? It's pretty graphic. It's so graphic. In fact, I would venture to say that the account of what took place with Lot in Sodom and Gomorrah is, as we say it, too much information, TMI. I really didn't want to know that about when the angels came to get Lot out, what Lot did. <laughs> what the people there in the city tried to do. I, I don't want to know that. No, you need to know that. Why? Because that's what it is today. I tell you, it's getting worse. Maybe I don't need to tell you that. You know, I, I heard they added a couple letters to LGBTQ. Oh, you heard this too. I wonder how many letters they had in Lot's day. Hmm. It was the same in the days of Lot. People were eating and drinking, partying, buying and selling, business as usual, planting and building. But the day Lot left Sodom, fire and sulfur rained down from heaven and destroyed them all. You know what Jesus is saying? Uh, that's what's going to happen now, because it's like the days of Lot. It's like the days of Noah. And by the way, uh, this is a type of the pre-tribulation rapture, because before even one single fire or brimstone came down, Lot was taken out. In fact, that was the rush. In fact, there's a detail in the narrative. It's very interesting, because Lot hesitated. So did his wife. We know what happened to her. 
I don't mean to sound, you know, humorous about it. It's kind of sad, actually. But even Lot hesitated. And we're told that the angel of the Lord grabbed them by the hands and took them out by force to get them out. Because the the judgment was coming. The fire and the brimstone was coming down, but it could not come down until Lot was taken out. That's the pre-tribulation rapture. Lot is a type of the church taken out before the judgment comes down. Number five, increase of lawlessness. I don't think it's possible to overstate the prevalence today of lawlessness. Second Thessalonians chapter 2, really the entire chapter, but I'll read verses 7 through 10. For the secret power of lawlessness is already at work, but the one who now holds it back will continue to do so till he is taken out of the way. And then the lawless one will be revealed. That's the Antichrist whom the Lord Jesus will overthrow with the breath of His mouth and destroy by the splendor of His coming. The coming of the lawless one will be in accordance with how Satan works. He will use all sorts of displays of power through signs and wonders that serve, interesting, the lie. Not a lie, the lie. And all the ways that wickedness deceives those who are perishing. They perish because they refused to love the truth and so be saved. Who's the truth? Jesus the Christ, the way, the truth, and the life. Number four, I need to keep moving here. A global cry almost an insatiable quest for peace and security. This is 1 Thessalonians 5.3. While people are saying peace and security, peace and safety, it's the same word in the original language of the Greek New Testament, asphalia, translated security, safety, peace and security. Destruction will come on them, key word, suddenly. And here it is again as labor pains on a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. Aren't you glad you're not a they? I hope you're not a they. If you're here today and you're a they, you need to be a we. Because we do escape. Because we who are alive and remain will be caught up, taken out to meet the Lord in the air. We're not going to be here for this. Number three, an intoxicating obsession with dividing Jerusalem. I I say it and couch it in those terms for a reason. I think you'll see why here. Zechariah 12 verses 1 through 3. A prophecy, the word of the Lord concerning Israel, the Lord who stretches out the heavens, who lays the foundation of the earth, and who forms the human spirit within a person, declares, I am going to make Jerusalem a cup that sends all the surrounding peoples reeling. Judah will be besieged, as well as Jerusalem. On that day, when, listen, all the nations of the earth are gathered against her, I will make Jerusalem an immovable rock for all the nations. All who try to move it will injure themselves. You know what this prophecy is saying? That on that day, there's coming a day, on that day, all the nations of the earth will be obsessed. They'll have this intoxicating obsession, drinking from the cup that God sends and makes his city, Jerusalem, the city that he put his name on, literally. Of all of the cities, of all of the tribes of Israel, he chose Jerusalem 
to put His name of ownership on. We've talked about that before, literally. The name of God is on the city of Jerusalem. I own that, not you. And you want to come in and start moving the boundary stones? They're immovable. You can't move them. Oh, you're going to try? Okay. You're going to cut it up? I'll cut you up. You're going to divide Jerusalem? I'm going to divide you. Pretty strong. Number two, a confirming of a seven-year peace agreement with many. Daniel 9.27, one of the most detailed prophecies in the Bible. We've talked about this at length in the past. Let me just read it. He, speaking of the Antichrist, will confirm a covenant with many for one seven. That's the seven-year tribulation. In the middle of the seven, the three and a half year mark, He will put an end to sacrifice and offering. And at the temple, which presupposes that the temple has been rebuilt, which I truly believe, and am increasingly convinced that part of this peace agreement, this seven year peace covenant, will include the Jews being able to rebuild their temple. In fact, that's what's going to seal the deal for them, because the Jews will do anything to have their temple. They'll give up anything. He can have this. We get our temple. Yeah. Where do I sign? And so at the very beginning, I believe, of the seven year tribulation, the Jews will rebuild their temple. And then at the midpoint, the Antichrist is going to set himself up in that temple. And as Paul says in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, that's why the whole chapter is good to read. It comports with what we're told here in Daniel 9, 27. He's going to commit this abomination that causes desolation at the midpoint. And at the temple, He will set up an abomination that causes desolation until the end that is decreed is poured out on Him. And last, but certainly not least, I am putting at number one, the forming of a one world religion, a one world government, and a one world economy. I want to read uh, verses 15 through 18 in Revelation 13. The second beast was given power to give breath to the image of the first beast, so that the image could speak and cause all who refused to worship the image to be killed. It also, listen, forced all people, great and small, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hands or on their foreheads, so that they could not buy or sell unless they had the mask. Oh, pardon me, the mark. I am sorry. I, no, I, you, you, you got that right. Tell me you did. which is the name of the beast, or the number of its name. This calls for wisdom, that the person who has insight calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man. That number is 666. The reason I'm putting the forming of a one world religion a one world government, and a one world economy as the number one prophecy in play today is because of the current controlled demolition of the global order as we know it. Namely, that of the COVID-19 agenda to deliberately destroy the global economy, the global governments. See, it's a controlled demolition of the global economy, a controlled demolition of the global governments, and it will simultaneously bring about the uniting of the global religions. All under the banner of COVID-19. 
You'll forgive me for saying it like this, but this is brilliant. I mean, I would be hard pressed. I think you would be hard pressed to come up with a better plan. How are we going to bring in a one world government, a one world economy, a one world religion? Well, first we got to get rid of the governments that exist today. We got, got to get rid of the economies that we can't do this until they're out of the way. Okay, well then what are we going to do? <laughs> I, could, I couldn't think of a more brilliant plan, evil plan. It's an evil plan than to bring COVID-19 into the world. And you completely, with the stroke of a pen, so to speak, destroy the current world order. And it's deliberate. There's that word again, deliberate. You know what that means, right? It means it's deliberate to deliberately destroy the global order so as to implement the World Economic Forum's Great Reset. What's the Great Reset? Well, it's just that. It's to reset the global economy with a digital currency and the technology with it leading to a universal basic income, aka UBI. Maybe you've already been, you're going to start hearing a lot more about this. Universal basic income. By the way, uh, cash, very bad, very bad. Don't touch it. You'll, you'll get the virus. Give us your cash. We have two agape boxes in the back. You can put them in there. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> but they got, they got to get rid of cash. It's not about destroying the U.S. dollar, the petrodollar. It's about introducing a new digital currency. And they already have the technology to do it. And what comes packaged with it is this universal basic income where everybody gets the same amount. And this cashless system and universal basic income will be predicated upon what's known as social credit scores in order for you to be able to buy or sell. You want to know about social credit scores? Uh, you need look no further than to China. So here's how it works. It's like a credit score. You want to buy something and borrow the money. You have to have a high credit score or you can't. Same thing is true with the social credit scores. The social credit scores will be determined by one's compliance with and acceptance of the global governance and requirements. Further, one's compliance will be monitored by way of surveillance, which will be enforced vis-a-vis -vis the mandated COVID-19 vaccine. According to recent reports, the nonprofit trust Commons Project Foundation, which is, no surprises here, part of the World Economic Forum, is at the ready to release three different smartphone apps. One is called Common Health, another COVID Check, and the third is Common Pass. Uh, several weeks ago now, we, uh, in an update, I, I talked about COVID Pass, and I went back into my archives and tried to find that website, and I went to the URL, and it uh, took me to the World Economic Forum website. And now they don't call it that. They have COVID check, Common Pass, Common Health. All three of these apps, which now are in the phones, and eventually will be incorporated into humans that have been dehumanized. And by the way, I'll mention more about that in a moment. So all of them get this. 
will collect, store, and monitor people's health data in order to determine where they are allowed to travel, study, work, and live. Have a nice afternoon. <laughs> Coming soon to a smartphone near you. Late last night, I happened upon a very interesting article. I spent about an hour on this, and, uh, and I realized I probably should eat dinner and go to bed. But it was an article about a book published 990 years ago, titled The Worker, Dominion and Form. It was written by an Ernst Junger, if I'm pronouncing his name correctly, in which he predicted the use of face masks to enforce conformity. Here's a quote from the article. The dystopian age of the mask for the eradication of all individuality is a running theme of all dystopian literature, with face masks now becoming a mandatory forced part of the new normal. <laughs> that's a, that's a oxymoron. New, if it's new, it's not normal. If it's normal, it's not new. New normal, part of the new normal, face masks. The enforcement measures to make people wear them by both agents of the state and members of the general public are becoming more dehumanizing and draconian. 90 years ago. Given the sudden ubiquity of the face mask in 2020 across the entire globe, and in an increasing number of social contexts, it is impossible to avoid the conclusion that this is precisely the sort of development Junger had in mind. Our readiness, listen, to obscure the face reflects the dehumanizing tendencies that for Junger underlie the modern period. It represents another stage in the degradation of the individual that become explicit in the First World War, whether as a scrap of material on the battlefield or a cog in the machine of the wartime economy, the modern age has a habit of reducing the human being to a functional object. Everything non-essential, everything that is, that makes us human is discarded. We talked about social distancing human touch, human contact, human interaction. Do you know that social interaction, human interaction, human touch is what makes us human? This obscuring of the covering of the face, it dehumanizes us. And if you think about it, if you have to bring in this, this new order, you have to get rid of the individual. It, it all has to be collective. Lest you write this off as conspiracy theory or science fiction, let me hasten to say that everything I've mentioned heretofore today is already happening as we speak. And not only is it happening, it is moving forward at, again, I'll use that phrase, warp speed. Moreover, this has been planned for many years, many decades. And what if I told you that it was decided that the year 2020 would be the year to execute the plan? Here's the truth. 
the plan is to control the population by first reducing the population in order to control it. I have been for the last how many months now, 30 plus weeks, talking about this. And if you don't mind, I want to refer to those updates. And again, the links will be in the description. It was either that or spend the next 30 plus hours going through all of the things that you don't want to do that, right? Right? Some of you are going, yeah, why not? Wow, okay. (laughs) Starting on March 29th, we looked at how and why this crisis may in fact be that which ultimately leads to the rapture of the church the Antichrist's revelation and the seven year tribulation in that order, March 29th. April 19th, we looked at how and why this global crisis was, this is back in April, was reshaping, even resetting the entire world order, ushering in the new world order, exactly as we are told it would in the book of Revelation. April 26th, we talked about where all of this is going, namely that of implementing the agenda already in place to, this is very specific, and this is where we talked about Bill Gates and the plan, the plan, you know, the plan that Q says, trust the plan, that plan, to both reduce and control the population. That's what this is all about. May 10th, I sensed that the Lord would have me to talk about how we passed the proverbial point of no return. There was no turning back. That it was, I hate to say it like this, game over with the evil that was being done and is being done under the banner of this manufactured crisis. I call it a manufactured crisis. Let me Again, qualify that. I do believe there is a virus. I do not believe there is a pandemic. It is a manufactured crisis to destroy the current world order, to usher in the new. May 17th, we took an in-depth look at what's coming by way of contact tracing and HR 6666, which is a bill to test, reach, and contact everyone. That's the acronym, TRACE. This is what I call trace and race towards a mandated vaccine that we're told, by the way, is going to be uh, available, even though the human trials are killing people, just so you know. Did you hear about this? No. Good. See you guys. June 7th. This was a hard one for me. I just have to confess. I love this country. I hope this doesn't come off wrong, but um, I love this country more than most. My parents immigrated to this great country when I was nine months old. I was born in Beirut, Lebanon. And they spent five years studying, preparing to get their citizenship. And I'll never forget that day when they were at the ceremony to officially become U.S. citizens. My mommy and my daddy, with tears streaming down their face, had become American citizens. You know, what's interesting is I had the choice because I was still young and I was born in Beirut, Lebanon. When I turned 18, I had a choice. I could either retain my Lebanese citizenship or automatically, because of my parents, become a U.S. citizen. Hmm. Dun, 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 dun. (laughs) Where I come from, they call that a (laughs) no-brainer. So I am an American. (laughs) America been very, very good to me. Okay. Anyway, (laughs) sorry I had a flashback. Young people have no idea what that was a reference to. But it was hard. 
this particular update, we looked at what's happening to America and in America as it relates to the conspicuous absence in Bible prophecy of America. June 14th, we talked about the pre-planned, even staged events, and they are staged. They are pre-planned. And they all have the same end of bringing about the aforementioned world reset, the great reset. On July 12th, we cleared up much of the confusion surrounding a yet future vaccine becoming the mark of the beast foretold of in the book of Revelation. Now, there are many, and I, I think I probably should address this just real quick. There are many who say, well, how are you going to get an injection in your forehead? You're not. Uh, it's called a quantum dot tattoo. It's a tattoo, a mark. And during the tribulation, you have to show proof that you've been vaccinated. If you don't have a mark sh showing proof that you've been vaccinated, you cannot enter a store like today. You cannot enter the store without a mask. That's how it's going to come. And the technology is already in place. July 26, this was a very interesting and tough one. We dared to address the very controversial mask mandates as it relates to both their ineffectiveness and their prophetic significance. And since then, even today, uh, I referred to it. Uh, there's a lot more to these masks. August 9th, this one, I, it was almost like the Lord was impressing upon my heart <laughs> to revisit the sound doctrine of the pre-tribulation rapture. Because a lot of people, and I have to admit, I was starting to, you know, with everything that was happening, I'm like, the rapture has to happen, right? Yeah. I went back into my notes and I devoted an entire Sunday to proof, seven proofs from Scripture that prove a pre-tribulation rapture. And I am uh, happy to say that after that, I was settled. No problem. I mean, yeah, they understand. I was getting phone calls from guys, brothers, pastors, fellow pastors, that are saying things to me like, maybe it's not. Like, no, you can't tell me that. No, it is. Yeah, but I'm starting to question it. Hence this update on August 9th. I want to encourage you, if any of you are sitting here today and the enemy is just filling your heart and your mind with fear. God's not giving you a spirit of fear. I want to encourage you on the authority of God's Word that the rapture of the church absolutely must happen before the seven year tribulation. We will not be here for this. Yeah, praise the Lord. August 16th, we talked about the prophetic significance of the U.S. President's brokered peace agreement between Israel and the United Arab Emirates. I don't know if you're uh, kind of seeing this as I go through all of this, and I appreciate your patience with me on this, but do you see the, the collective nature of all of these prophecies simultaneously? Sorry, I... <laughs> I probably spit on everybody, you know, our visitors here from Oregon. God bless you guys. August 30th, this was an interesting one. We looked at how over the years the entertainment industry has successfully pre-programmed and brainwashed the masses to be in lockstep compliance using a virus as a global crisis. And the final solution, I use those two words for a reason, is a vaccine. You go back at, and look at some of these major movies, blockbusters as we call them, and what you'll find is that was the common theme. September 6th, 
We talked about the massive deception creating a satanic confusion, which is leading to the division and ensuing destruction, ushering in the Antichrist and the rapture of the church of Jesus Christ. September 13th, we talked about the only way to make any sense out of the unprecedented events in the world today is to first view everything through the lens of Bible prophecy. In other words, don't look at what's happening and then go to the Bible. No, no, go to the Bible first, and then look at what's happening. September 27th, we answered the question of how we can really know the truth by discerning between what's real or fake and fact or fiction. October 4th, we talked about how the world today is increasingly perilous with each passing day. But God (laughs) is meaning it for good to bring about the salvation of many in these last days. October 11th, two weeks ago, I shared my research concerning masks, social distancing, and hand washing being initiation rituals into the new world order out of chaos, and how it points to Jesus and the imminent rapture of the church. Last week, October 18th, I warned about the dangers concerning conspiracy theories being either completely dismissed on one extreme, or on the other extreme, leaving one so confused they don't know what to believe, or more importantly, who to believe, despite it being not conspiracy theory, but conspiracy fact. This brings us to today. A couple years ago, I really sensed from the Lord that it was incumbent upon me with the prophecy updates to get as many people to Jesus as I possibly can before it's too late. And I stand before you today, as is my privilege to every week. And I'm going to say it again. I hope you don't tire of me saying it, but there is no more time. His return in the rapture of the church is imminent. It's at the door. We are so close. Everything that we've looked at since the beginning of this crisis, back in March, 30 plus weeks, it points to one thing, Jesus. Jesus is coming. That's our only hope. That's our only hope. Our only hope is in Jesus Christ and His return for His church. Let me take it one step further, and then we'll bring it in for a landing. Everything that's happening now, all of these things that I've shared with you today, they will ultimately be fulfilled in and during the seven year tribulation. And if we're already starting to see things that will be fulfilled, those prophecies that are going to be fulfilled during the seven year tribulation, and the rapture has to happen before the seven year tribulation, then I ask you, in all sincerity, lovingly, humbly, kindly, I ask you this question. If that's true, and it is, then how close are we really? I believe that we are closer than any of us could possibly even begin to imagine. This is why we do these updates. This is why we've been doing these updates. This is why we end with the gospel of salvation and the person of Jesus Christ. It's also why we end with a childlike, simple explanation of salvation by way of the ABCs of salvation. What's the gospel? 
1 Corinthians chapter 15, the Apostle Paul writing says that the gospel that he preached was that Jesus came, He was crucified, He was buried, and He rose again on the third day. When Paul writes to the Thessalonians, he says this, the gospel is this, Christ came, He was crucified, He was buried, He rose again on the third day, and He's coming back again one day in the rapture of the church. That's the gospel, the good news. For the last couple of months now, we've been sharing testimonies, and we receive these from online members, and uh, they are such a great and tremendous encouragement to so many. And I want to just share with you uh, a couple more today, if you don't mind. This first one comes from Lane Hynight. He's actually one of our staff members. He lives on the Big Island. He writes, Good evening all. Thought I'd share with you all the tremendous news that I had the opportunity to pray with my sister this evening for her to receive salvation. She was driving on a long drive from Texas to Louisiana from work to home, and after discussing COVID-19, politics, and the truths of the Lord and the Bible, she decided that it was time. She pulled over. I pulled up the ABCs of salvation, and we prayed together. My sister has now joined us among the redeemed of Christ. Praise the Lord. I had to share this with somebody. And you folks get to be the somebodies. So, you know, I've been sharing with you about online members putting up billboards of the ABCs of salvation and the prophecy updates. Well, pictured here is a tweet from an online member by the name of Nick Painter, who posted this on my Twitter page. He says, at J.D. Farag, saw this billboard on my way to an appointment in Boise, Idaho, and had to take a picture and send it to you. I've been watching the weekly Bible prophecy updates for about six months, and I'm so glad to have found you on YouTube. Thank you for speaking God's truth, truly eye-opening. By the way, for those of you online, as I understand it, there are uh, billboards all over the U.S. now. And if you have, yes, praise the Lord, right? Um, Lane was telling me that there's an online member in New York that put up a billboard that's right next to a train, uh, train tracks. <laughs> this is, so for you online members, there are two things we do not have here in Hawaii, billboards and trains. So <laughs> we, we just need to live this vicariously by proxy. So send us pictures of these billboards when you drive by them. So this online member in New York put up a billboard right next to these train tracks. So when the train goes by every day, how many times a day? Five minutes. They're looking at the ABCs of salvation right there. How cool is that? It's not just that. We, we continue. Man, you guys are amazing. We get sent shirts, hats, uh, bumper stickers. Pictured here is a bumper sticker from an online member, Eternal Lives Matter. And I mean, in addition to, oh, here's another one. Uh, but God, I just got this amazing shirt. You can't have it. It's mine. It was given to me. <laughs> And big letters, but God, yeah, <laughs> says it all, those two words. Anyway, an online member sent us this photo. How cool is this? She says, greetings, fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. I just wanted to send a little note. Speaking of billboards, many have lovingly donated their time and money to reach the lost with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Praise God for these beautiful people of God. I often thought and wished I could do some great thing as well to reach many. After all, it is the Spirit of God who wills that none perish. And since He moved into my heart, it is also my wish that none perish, but all come to a saving knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. So I try to use every resource God gives me, 
One of those resources is the rear window of my car. This car isn't mine. All things belong to the Lord. He gave it to me, and I intend on using it to His glory. He also blessed us with a Bible ministry in which I and my two young boys uh, put printed or handwritten passages of Scripture that lead to salvation on the cover of each Bible. We then put that Bible in a Ziploc bag to keep it safe from the elements and distribute them all over town at bus stops and park benches. The last shipment we did was 72 Bibles to the local jailhouse. We've so far distributed 492 Bibles. We are praying that God will grow this ministry to where we can send Bibles to every prison in America. We love you and our church family all over the world. God bless you and keep you all in the love of Christ. Praise the Lord. (laughs) I want to uh, do the ABCs of salvation just a little bit differently today. So the Lord just kind of reminded me of, we affectionately refer to Him as the thief on the cross. I don't know if that was His crime. We do know that it was a crime punishable by death. That's why He was on the cross that day with the Savior of the world, along with another thief or criminal. And it was really interesting because Uh, what the Lord ministered to me and reminded me of was that this criminal that was being crucified with the Savior of the world at the same time on that same hill, actually did the ABCs. And here's how I get there. First, he acknowledged that Jesus was who he said he was. The other guy is like, come on, if he was really the Savior, he could get up, he could save himself from the cross. And then this guy's going, oh, no, he's, he's the Savior. I, I, and he acknowledges, admits that he's the Savior and that he's a sinner. And he believes in Jesus, and so much so that he, he calls upon the Lord and he says to the Lord, Lord, will you remember me when you enter the kingdom of heaven. What was Jesus' response? Not so fast, buckaroo. No. He didn't say to him, well, you know, it's kind of late because you got to get off that cross, go get water baptized before you can be saved. No. He said, truly, truly, I say unto you, today you will be with me in paradise. No. I guess that would be a textbook deathbed conversion. And by the way, I I say that kind of humorously, but seriously, I believe that account was recorded in the pages of Holy Writ, because God wanted us to know that it's never too late. That there are many who know that they're about to take their last breath in this life and their first breath in eternal life. And all they have to do, like this criminal, is come to that place where the conviction of the Holy Spirit is such that you acknowledge that you're a sinner, that you need a Savior. That's the A. Romans 3.10 says, there is no one righteous, not even one. Romans 3.23 says, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. One would think this would be a firm grasp of the obvious, but this is the number one obstacle, isn't it? When you talk to somebody, you're sharing the gospel with them. What's the the number one answer you get? Well, I'm a good person. I haven't murdered anybody. I, I have answers for that. I don't want you to use what I use, you know, use what the Holy Spirit gives you. But I've gotten a lot nicer over the years. You know, I used to get real Never mind. <laughs> it is a custom in my country. But I would just say, you know, first of all, there's going to be a lot of good people in hell and a lot of very bad people in heaven, because that's not what your entrance into heaven is predicated upon. There was none that was good. There was only one, and that was Jesus the Christ. Romans 6.23 says, 
the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. That's the A, here's the B. The B is for believe in your heart that Jesus Christ is Lord. And as Romans 10, 9 and 10 says, if you believe in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead, you will be saved. And then lastly, the C is for call upon the name of the Lord. Or as Romans 10, 9 and 10 again says, if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. And here's why. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you confess and are saved. And then lastly, Romans 10, 13. This was what the thief on the cross did. He called out to the Lord. He called upon the name of the Lord. All who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. It's that simple. It's childlike simple. Why don't you all stand and we'll pray. We'll have the worship team come up. And as I pray, I just would ask if there's anyone here today. There's nothing you have to do if you're watching online, there's nothing you have to do. He did it all. It's finished. There's nothing you could add to it. It's finished. It's done. He paid the price in full. All you have to do is receive the gift that He paid for and offers to you, and that's the gift of eternal life. It's a gift to you, but it cost him everything. It cost him his life. And he purchased it, that gift that he gives to you. All you have to do is receive, believe and receive. That's it. It's that simple. You don't have to come forward. Nothing wrong with that. I just, we don't have the, what would be known as the traditional altar call where we have you all come forward and you don't have to do that. Hey, when I got saved 38 years ago, I'm not proud of this. I was so high. I was a drug addict, drug dealer, really. I was so drunk, basically an alcoholic. And I saw the gospel presented in a very simple, it had to be simple. I had killed so many brain cells. God's been faithful over years. He's given me a few of them back. <laughs> but it was just very simply explained. And I realized, oh my goodness, I need Jesus. I'm a sinner. He's the Savior. And I went into my room, and, it, and there's also nothing magical, for lack of a better word, about the prayer, the sinner's prayer. Well, don't, don't you have to repeat after me? No. Don't you have to say it a certain way? Could you imagine? You're, you're calling upon the name of the Lord to be saved. And Jesus says, that's it? That's all you got? That's your prayer? Come on, you can do better than that. No. I mean, the, the thief on the cross again. Hey, all he said was, uh, can I go with you? I'm a sinner. You're the Savior. I believe. That's it. 